So welcome, my name is Chris Wall. I'm the technical evangelist at Rubrik. And this particular session is gonna be all about introducing you to Rubrik. We're gonna baseline kind of everybody on where the company's at, who's there, whatnot. I know some of you have done some homework. So you've got caffeine back there for those that wanna tune out for just a short period. But trust me, it's gonna be a fun packed day. Okay, so first off, uh, if I get my clicker back on. Welcome, you're in Austin, it's where I live. I love this place. And it's Tech Field Day, the signal has gone up and we have answered the call and we're gonna to talk to some really snazzy guests here that are my favorite delegates. For those just tuning in, I wanna get you up to speed on kind of who Rubrik is. We're gonna start with the folks that are there. Anyone gets brownie points for, I think Tom, Tom what's that movie? That's Hackers. That is Hackers, yeah. correct. That is Penn Gillette. Yes, yes. Yep. who is in Hackers. Yes, yes, it's amazing. There's all sorts that, I'm sorry, I don't take decks seriously. It's completely loaded with memes. You'll be able to tell my slides versus the corporate slides. This is a corporate slide. <laughs> but anyways, when I was looking at Rubrik and looking at the folks that were there, that was the big decision maker for me to join the company. Right? I think that the folks that work within the company are obviously the most quintessential asset and going to really drive success or failure. Right? You either have really great people who are gonna build something amazing or not. The, the, the technology is largely irrelevant. Even uh, if you don't have good people, they're not gonna build a good product. And so these are the four founders. Two of them are here with me. Uh, Bipul Sinha and Arvin Nithrakashap, which we call him Nitro, is over here. <laughs> uh, and they are amazing folks who are working, I think, uh, at, at some really technical levels in Oracle, building things like uh, Exadata, Oracle Rack, and just uh, phenomenal amounts of talent. Not here is uh, Arvin Jane or AJ, as well as Soham who, uh, as it says here, AJ was probably the most intimidating person I've ever interviewed with in my life. He starts out by saying, you know, I, I did, did some stuff at Riverbed. He was like this uh, founder at the technology level there, like a founding technology engineer. And then, oh, I kind of got bored with that and went to Google and did things like Google Fiber. And he's throwing out all these things that I take for granted today that were just like, you know, milestones on his career, uh, but with humbleness. You know, he's just kind of listing this laundry list to get to the point. And so, great guy, and then Soham as well. Um, and he was working as a Google staff engineer and a Facebook engineer. So, top talent at the founding level. And then I added that for Nitro, he didn't know about the cowboy hat. I almost forgot about that. And we've been in various different uh, you know, publishments like CRN and CNBC and Fox has said some really cool things about me. Or not about me, about Rubrik. Uh, so that's some cool stuff. Yeah, they don't even know who I am. Uh, but the other thing I wanted to point out before I go kind of too deep in the weeds on the folks, is that there's a neat formula that I like about Rubrik. Right? And it says there, two parts consumer, one part enterprise. And being an enterprise architect for so long, that was one of the things I felt was missing from the enterprise, is that that consumer simplicity, right? That Apple time machine kind of functionality that we all take for granted as consumers. I'm obviously not an Apple guy, I'm a Microsoft and Android guy, but there's still things where the system just kind of works, right? I don't have to do anything with it. And in a lot of the consulting engagements I worked with, it was great, I have this architecture, I have this product, I want to deploy it, that's gonna be four months, something like that. And it's gonna require four certifications and engineers that are certified up the wazoo to get it done. And so we've got really great people from companies like Google and Facebook merged together with other people from Data Domain, VMware, and Oracle to build a first class, you know, enterprise class product or solution that blends the simplicity and the elegance in the consumer market with the robustness and the feature rich requirements of the enterprise market, right? So I think that's an important combination. These guys are all amazing, amazing folks that I, they really drew me to the company. And then the last thing that I'll do kind of on the corporate side of things is these folks here actually put their own money into the company at early, early points, Ooh. right? They didn't just say, Rubrik sounds like a good idea. They said, Rubrik sounds like a really great idea to the point where I want to give you my money. Like that, have you ever seen uh, Futurama where Fry's holding out the money, like shut up and give him, get, yeah, just that. Uh, so, you know, folks that kind of built semantic data domain and Veritas said, this sounds like a great idea, take some money, along with uh, some VC money from Lightspeed and Greylock, right? So I think that helps, I guess, set the table as far as who was interested and who's put their faith in the company, both from a career and paycheck perspective as well as investments. Now, where have things been kind of going since our last touch point when we were at Virtualization Field Day 5, right? It's been a rocket ship. I tried to put a little Rubrik logo on the, space, uh, the SpaceX vehicle there, but I thought maybe I'd get sued or I don't know. So I didn't, but just pretend one's there. Yeah, what's that? I could try, I could try. 
<laughs> so here's what we've been up to. Founded in January 2014, we just celebrated our second birthday. And from an employee count, it's just been going bananas. You know, we started with the, the, the four, the dirty quad, I guess, you know, the, the, the badasses that founded the company. And then it just been ramping up. I started uh, right around this marker. I think I was employee 47 or 48. And it's just been ramping up like crazy. From a product perspective, version 1.0 landed right around two, uh, Q2 of last year, right? And that was when we introduced a product. I wasn't at the company yet, but we introduced uh, the rubric hybrid cloud appliance that could do policy-driven architecture for backup and recovery. And I'll, I'll go into that. But just from a timeline perspective, that was pretty cool. Followed by another explosion, uh, barely even a quarter and a half later, maybe two quarters later, when version 2.0 came out. And some people were like, why not 1.1 or something like that? It's because the amount of features and the amount of engineering that went into that release was ridiculous, right? In basically two quarters, we added things like replication between appliances, which a lot of vendors that I worked with on the startup side, that's a couple years of investment and time. So within a couple quarters, replication, we added new targets for our archive uh, for data that you're ingesting. You could archive to NFS and other object stores, uh, as well as a whole slew of reporting around compliance, SLAs, things like that. So a lot of features got added. That's why it was version two. It was just too big to call one dot anything, right? From a roadmap perspective, with version two, we introduced a lot of neat features. Uh, replication was one of them. The NFS archive and reporting was another. We also introduced, I didn't actually put it on the other slide, Active Directory authentications. You can integrate with AD, which I think is kind of table stakes for enterprise, right? People expect that feature to be in there. And we introduced a brand new appliance, the 348, right? So we had a very storage dense appliance that was added in the second release. From a company kind of snapshot perspective, all the little green doodads that you see across the world are actually where rubric folks are at. You know, we have employees and offices across the world, right? So we've had two major releases since the company kind of went GA last year, uh, mid last year. Uh, we've got over 50 channel partners who have said, I want to go to market with rubric. You know, I want to sell this because the channel, I think the channel is a good thermometer for how a product's doing because their whole goal is to make margin, right? They want to sell something that's going to increase or make new relationships with their customers, right? If they sell something like crap, they're probably going to lose that customer. And they're looking to make money off this stuff. And so a lot of folks have put their trust into us. And we're actually exceeding four petabytes of protected data in the field, right? So this isn't vaporware or some kind of, you know, made up number. It's just the actual data that's protected. Yes, Enrico. There is a reason why you have most of your people on the uh, East Coast. East Coast or the US itself? OK, so it's a. Uh... Yeah, I don't know the... Oh, I, I just want to clarify. It, yeah, the East Coast? I don't, why do we have everyone on the East Coast? That's where all the cool stuff is going on, right? <laughs> I don't know. I think it's just, uh, it's not representative of the quantity of people. There's a lot of folks in Palo Alto. You know, the engineering team and the product team and such are that bloop on the left side. The East Coast, we've got, you know, it's sales and field and things like that. And then I'm the little, I'm the little blip in Texas, so that's, that's me. Okay. Um, okay, so that's the kind of what the heck is going on, where have we been, to catch those up that have been kind of following along. Now I have to, I have to state the problem, I'm sorry, but it has to be done. So I'll be quick about it, and, I, and we're now off corporate slides, obviously. So <laughs> what is the problem? Backup sucks. Um, I've been in IT since the late 90s. I never wanted to be a backup admin. I'm sorry for those that are backup admins. I love that you are, because I don't want to be one. But every time I was asked to protect data, I kind of just hated life, and I wasn't very good at it. That's the problem, right? It's not something, it's something you set up, and you hope you get it right, but if you screw up the architecture on the initial config, that architecture is broken as it scales, or tries to scale, I should say. And not much has changed. If we look at the past decade, the architecture has fundamentally remained exactly the same, right? There's also another challenge, in that most of the focus is on eating the data, or ingesting the data, right? How fast can we get data from A to B, terabytes a second, gigabytes a second, something like that. A lot of the technologies are not really focused on how to get the data back and find the data and restore the data quickly, right? Maybe I can spit the data back out quickly, but actually restoring the data takes a while, right? And that's, that's a problem, right? Can I easily and quickly restore the data? You know, can I find what I need and actually put it where it needs to go? So here's the architecture. Traditionally, uh, I think this is the 90s. Yep, this was the 90s. This is what we had, servers, proxies, Databases, things like that, that cataloged it. And it went to tapes, those went off site. This is when I started working with backup. Ray, Ray I, I think I started after you. 
No. You, I think you were no, before I me. I think you were before me, Chris. Before you? Okay. At least in backup. Probably. In backup. Okay. Yeah. I, just, I don't know. Maybe you had some cool, you know, we're backing up IBM Sharks or something back in the day. So. <laughs> don't go there. <laughs> And so if you look at what really changed over the past, you know, this is a, like a 25 year snapshot, we added deduplication or other space efficiencies, you know, ways that we can massage the data and make it more efficient, uh, either source or target. And we added disk to the equation as a landing zone that could be either a cache or a staging area to keep your RTOs low within a data center. Right? That's really, if you look at it, those are the architecture changes. Very simple. The challenge is that you almost have to build a small data center in order to protect a data center. That was my big challenge. When I started working with a shop that had you know, a thousand some odd servers, we had to build out an environment that was almost you know, a third of the data center, it felt like, because you know, it was all virtualized. So I had maybe a row and a half of ESXi hypervisors and virtual machines, and then another half row of my backup stuff. I was like, that's crazy. A third of my data center is backing up the other two thirds. Uh, because you have to figure out all these complexities, you know, how many proxies. How many folks have you worked with that you ask them, how many proxies do I need based on this data set? And they can give you the definitive answer that's absolutely going to be right. But it's like never. They always go, well, it feels like uh, 10 proxies. You know, no, no, no. You know, it's, a very, it's a very swag type of effort. And then you've got all these single points of failure you have to solve for. Typically, you have to solve it or solve it with some other product. Right? So one I'll bring up is the backup server. You know, yes, it can back itself up. Oftentimes, it's relatively easy to restore from, but how, many, how often do you do that? How often do you rebuild a backup server from scratch and test the restore of that? Right? And you have to make sure that that's done. I'm not saying it can't be done, because it obviously can, but that's a consideration. You know, how am I gonna, are you going to deploy another backup server to back up the backup server? How inception-like do you want to make this? Right? And then the database server. That has to be protected, because I can't look at the catalog without the database. So these are other considerations. Do I do Always on availability groups, do I do HA, do I do some kind of distributed database? These are all questions you have to answer. And I was in the room when we were meeting about this, and I felt like the, the kind of jerk in the room. I was like, so we're putting a couple hundred, 300 some odd tapes in Iron Mountain every month. How do we restore any of that? Like an application or all of it? And they were, the team was like, ha, 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 let's update our resumes, get another job. It's like, the. That's really the answer? Like, is that the joke answer and there's a better answer after that answer? No, that was the answer. Like, they just didn't care. So I felt like everyone was just in this room drinking their coffee saying, well, sucks to be them if they lose their data. <laughs> so anyways, so here's where the converged data management of rubric comes into play, right? What the heck it is that we do. So we take backup software and we converge it with backup storage, right? Instead of having to manage all these things as discrete points within an architecture, you fold it all together and you turn it into an appliance. In this case, it's a 2U appliance that Nitro is going to go really deep into what it all does from a hardware perspective. I'll wrap up with the three things that I think are important, or at least takeaways that Nitro is going to go deeper at a technical level about converging your data management. Right? Number one is you're eliminating almost all the complexity. Right? As an architect, complexity is the enemy. The simpler I can make a solution, the better it's going to be for support, Right, for the next person that has to take it over after you stop working that job, for repair, break fix, troubleshooting, et cetera. Right, so the architecture with Rubrik is very simple. Uh, simple. It's linear. Right? Small data center, put in one appliance. Bigger data center, put in another appliance. Guess what? Bigger, another appliance. I mean, it makes the, the job trivial, like it should be. You could focus on actually protecting the data and not building the snowflake architecture for data protection. The second thing is intelligence. Right? A lot of these systems are very manually configured. Right? You have to go in and you have to tell the system exactly what you want. Here's a backup job. It's supposed to protect these 20 virtual machines. <clears throat> these are the workloads on the virtual machines. This is the proxy to use for those virtual machines or physical machines or whatever it is. The whole workflow, you have to like, kind of hold its hand and tell it exactly what to do. And whenever there's a change, you have to re-hold its hand and tell it what to do. That's very imperative. Rubrik offers a declarative model. You tell it, but you need it to do. What does the end state need to look like? Right? How much protection? What am I willing to lose? Where does the data need to live? And it figures out the rest. Right? And that's a trend we're seeing across the market. Right? Having a configuration of some sort handed off, like if you look at Puppet, Chef, Ansible, it's all about here's what the end state needs to be. Make that happen. I don't really care what you do to make that happen. Right? Rather than managing 101 cute puppy jobs. Because you know, we all like cute puppies and they're free, but we all know there's no such thing as a free puppy. You know, it makes a mess, you have to clean it up, and 
when you get 101 of these, that just doesn't scale. How, who's going to manage that, right? You'd have to have a person dedicated to just managing these things. The third and final thing is around policy. Right? I talked around declarative versus imperative. Right? If you have policy that's being coupled with that declarative statement, you can take very business language stuff, things like RPO and RTO, and bake it into a policy. Right? So I can take, these are stuff I, could, I should be able to talk to a business owner, an app owner, you know, an executive, depending on what the size of the company is. I should be able to bake these in at a non-technical level and have a conversation. Mr. Application Owner, how much data are you willing to lose? Zero? Okay, it's gonna cost this. Oh, I'll go to four hours? Fine, it'll cost this. Not, okay, Mr. App Owner, I'm gonna run a D4000 storage array going to this protocol that you're just gonna go, I don't know what that is. I don't want it. That sounds horrible. I'm going to the cloud. Bye, guys. So being able to put this business language and put it in an SLA is quintessential for abstracting away all that technology gobbledygook and making a policy that just says, here's the business language, here's what I'm gonna offer and I'm gonna do that through a declarative method, okay? So that is an introduction to rubric. Chris, can you give an example of the difference between an imperative statement of backup and a declarative statement of backup? Sure, so an imperative statement would say, kind of like the example that I gave you, right? You go and you build an action, often called a job or a workflow, and you tell it, back these, these are the workloads I wanna back up in this job, run it this time, Go to this storage repository. After you're at this storage repository, migrate the data over here. Everything it takes to meet the RPO and RTO value, you as a human have to abstract that out into the technology. Right? You have to know exactly how to make that happen. Versus declarative, where I literally just tell the system, these are the requirements and the constraints that I'm under. Figure out what it takes to make that happen. But you may not have the resources to make you know, RPO of zero time or something like that. Exactly, that's where we get back to uh, intelligence, right? The system should be intelligent enough to tell you, do you have the runway to do that? Is it even feasible? How long until you run out of space? But, kind but, of comes but, back but when that. you run it, and where do you run it? And how does it all get, you know, tied enough. together? So we'll save that for the technical deep dive. Uh, 